My name's Peter Coffin, and the attention bubble has burst. Ah, the YouTubers are quitting, and so am I. I quit. Ha 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 there would be some people who'd be very excited if that was a genuine announcement. But it's not, bitch! Ha! Ah! No, I'm gonna keep making YouTube videos. In fact, for whatever reason, I'm like the only person who's like doing better now than a couple of months ago, it seems like. I know somebody is gonna be like, yeah, I'm only getting a few thousand views a video. It's like, well, compare that to the few hundred I was getting uh, a year or two ago. <laughs> huh. But I think I might be the exception rather than the rule, and we'll talk about that in a minute. First off, a shitload of YouTubers are either quitting or scaling back their operations significantly and kind of acting like it's quitting. The biggest one as of right now is Matt Pat from Game Theory, who is not going to make content anymore. Um, however, he is going to retain ownership over the, uh, the Theory brand. MatPat, I think, the smartest of the bunch, keeping the uh, best of both worlds train rolling. Uh, we've got some other big ones, Seth Everman, uh, Tom Scott, Captain Sparkles. There's actually quite a few, and I don't intend to list all of them. And it's causing a bit of a stir. I've seen some videos about why YouTubers are quitting, which you're interested in that, clearly. You did click this. Don't act like you're better than me. We are the same. But there's a lot of talk about burnout and scale that I think does figure into why this is happening. So I said the attention bubble has burst. What do I mean by that specifically? Well, let's talk about all entertainment for a second, not just YouTube. First off, Marvel. That's not doing too good. For nearly a decade, they were able to spit out whatever schlop they came up with and people would go see it in droves. Marvel and or other superhero movies regularly made a billion dollars. A billion dollars. None of that's happening anymore. Let's talk about podcasts a little bit right now. Podcasts are in a pretty dire situation. Everyone has a podcast. And that means uh, companies like YMH Studios, Tom Segura's podcast, uh, studio. I don't know how justified it is in existing, and this isn't to say that Tom Segura is one way or another. If you like him, cool. If you don't, whatever. I don't give a shit. There's a ton of controversy involving him and the other Joe Rogan orbiting comedians with a podcast. They're getting a big old backlash for becoming pretty big and then not being quite as big, which is kind of like a weird backlash, but also they're not really taking it in stride, these folks. Another element I'd like to bring up, you may have seen people talking about how Facebook has sort of tapped out with new accounts, or perhaps leisure time. I've seen both. This is why, presumably, back in uh, October, Meta decided to roll out an ad-free program where you could subscribe and uh, not have your information shared, as well as not have ads in Europe. It's kind of the same idea as YouTube Premium. Uh, except for YouTube seems to not say anything about not sharing your information. So they probably still share your information. I, that's, that's, I mean, they have Americans pretty well trained on there. Europeans, I don't know. But here in America, YouTube Premium, they're probably sharing your information. But why am I saying the attention bubble has burst? Well, there's too much shit. You don't have enough time in a day to watch everything. But when you have this massive saturation and you have rewards that are passed out on a zero-sum basis, there are effects. We'll talk about the effects in a moment, but first I want to talk a little bit about scaling. So once you get into any kind of business, in a way, you find that there are other people in that business. Now, arguably, there are a lot of industries where there aren't a lot of competition, but with something like YouTube, there is. There is no competition to YouTube, and that's really, like, not an industry per se. It's more of a single business that everybody's doing contract work for. But everybody's competing to do that contract work. When somebody does something amazing and gets known for it, it's actually not a particularly sustainable thing for an individual. Like, when I make documentaries, for instance, which are, by the way, amazing, I put a lot of time into them much, much more time than I put into something like this. Require a lot of research, require a lot of, you know, graphics work, require costumes, require good filming capacity, all that kind of crap. It's not sustainable. 
even when it does what I want it to do, which the, my documentaries are all sitting at like 20 ish thousand views. That's pretty good. I'm happy with that. Um, monetarily speaking, that's a fucking disaster. But I also don't do them to make money. Now, what I'm talking about here is the necessity to scale a business if you want to be able to sustain it. And when you scale, you create something that is inherently different than if you are just doing something because it is a passion project of yours. When I do my documentaries, it doesn't really matter how long they take. I have a job. I make money somewhere other than my YouTube channel. But if I wanted to do my content as a business, I would need to figure out a way to scale. I could not make those documentaries at the speed that I currently make them. I would have to make them much faster. And I would still need to have employees for that type of a thing, which I don't have the money to do that. But here's the thing. As a YouTube channel scales, it often transforms. MatPat, for instance, has scaled pretty significantly. In his video where he's talking about retiring from the internet, he talks about how the Theory brand now has channels in four verticals where it's pretty much the premier channel. What that means is he's scaled far outside of the video game theory niche that he created. There are three other niches that they have channels that produce content regularly and successfully. This means they've had to grow pretty significantly. And as you become the center of a business, people depend on you. It's actually kind of scary, the thought of doing my documentaries with the understanding that their success is important for other people to eat or pay rent. That's actually terrifying to me. <laughs> so that scaling issue, which is talked about in several of these creators' videos, Tom Scott, for instance, talks about how he doesn't want to scale. He doesn't want to expand his operations and become a manager of various laborers. He doesn't like that idea. He likes the idea of making videos, and that puts him in the same category as me, except for a lot more successful because he uploads weekly and gets like a million minimum per upload. What's happening is he's feeling the pressure to scale on account. He's making videos that appear to be swallowed up, at least to him. I would suggest that because of the nature of the type of video he makes, the expense is also starting to outweigh uh, the ability to make money off of them. That may or may not be true. I don't really know anything financial about his videos. I would say that the margin is thinning, whether that's a big problem or a little problem, though. And that's, again, because the market is saturated. The attention bubble has burst. Now, whether they're scaling back or scaling up, a lot of the time, the content that they move into uh, tends to be more easy to produce content. Stuff that doesn't require an investment up front that's your commentary stuff, your reactions, your drama, your, your whatever, whatever you want to call that. So a lot of the balancing act of content in a saturated market is keeping costs down. So what a lot of people are doing instead of scaling up is scaling down or quitting. Now, what's actually happening uh, when saturation is reached? Well, um, that is something Karl Marx referred to as the crisis of overproduction. It's a problem of the distribution of value in terms of production, as well as automation. The people who create value never get that value in full. They're always paid a portion of it. So that means the value that's actually out circulating after value is generated is usually less. But when you bring in automation, you make it possible to make more of the thing that's considered valued, but with less human involvement, which is why something has value. If something takes an hour for me to make by hand, it's valuable in a way that the exact same thing 3D printed isn't. If I had a 3D printer, I could set a thing to 3D print. I could go take a shit. I could order pizza. I could walk down the street and say, hey to everybody. I don't know. It doesn't really matter what I do. Um, I don't have to put any work into it once it starts printing. And that makes that thing less valuable. If not immediately, then over time as 3D printing and the technology and amount of labor that it takes to make a thing becomes normal. So you have less value concentrated among the class that does most of the consuming, and you have the ability to make more stuff. 
That's obviously a contradiction. It's not good. Uh, it's basically the main problem of capitalism. There's a book called Fascism and Social Revolution by R. Palm Dutt that basically says uh, this problem is the thing that creates fascism and degrowth, what we're calling now. It wasn't called degrowth back in 1934 when this book was written, but degrowing the economy, um, making it so that we produce less, scaling back the apparatus of production, the machinery, destroying automation, as well as a lot of the time having a war and killing off a segment of the population. These types of measures alleviate that crisis because it shifts the economy in a manner that compensates for it. What we're kind of seeing with the YouTubers quitting or scaling back, it, it, it's degrowth. But it's not the only reaction. I think there's actually two primary reactions to this phenomenon, the oversaturation of the content market, specifically YouTube. The first one we've covered is quitting. And the second one is calling out plagiarism. Quitting or shifting focus, I'm going to regard as the sad reaction, and calling out plagiarism, I'm going to regard as the mad reaction. I worked really hard to get to the top, and now it's changing. I earned this. I'm the real creator, man. You aren't, you AI-using hack. You little plagiarizing bitch. Why do you think that you're a real creator? I'm the real creator. I'm going to tell my audience not to harass you. Also, I'm going to tell them not to think about pink elephants. And then pink elephants definitely won't be in their brain. Telling them not to think about pink elephants will definitely make them not think about pink elephants. Oh, would you look at that? They're harassing people into oblivion and calling it justice. Hmm. Yeah, that's the mad reaction. <laughs> These are the people that don't want to scale, but also still want to maintain their status as successful YouTube creators. I am producing a documentary right now called Plato is a Bitch, AI and Bomber Guy. And it addresses, in my opinion, what is driving the sort of mindset that the mad reaction has. They know that they have to degrow YouTube somehow. Otherwise, their, their time is limited as a YouTuber, maybe not as a Patreon guy. Maybe they can keep satisfying that in perpetuity. I don't know. But in order to maintain a YouTube career, something is going to have to change in YouTube because uh, the rewards are handed out on a zero-sum basis. If somebody watches me over them, I get the reward for it, which is why you should watch me rather than them. <laughs> No, I'm joking, and I don't expect you to watch me over anybody else. I don't really like that. I don't like the zero-sum game shit. The problem of overproduction is actually the result of treating everything as a zero-sum game. That class contradiction that I outlined, um, the appropriating of some of the value to the people who actually create it, that is actually the mathematical problem at the center of capitalism. So I'm not super psyched on it personally. But I will say, I am the exception rather than the rule. I mentioned this earlier, but for whatever reason, my channel is doing better than it has in a very long time. I will actually get an AdSense payout this month. But there isn't a saturation for what I'm doing. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of Marxists out there who are not talking about shit like this. They're not thinking about talking to everyone. They're thinking about talking to Marxists. And I'm never thinking about that. There's one Marxist I want to talk to, and it's hard for me to talk to that one. I'm talking, of course, about Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm sorry, that one, that one stuck up on me. I didn't think about that ahead. I didn't come up with that ahead of time. But what I'm basically saying here is you can look at what's going on with these quitting YouTubers, these scaling back YouTubers, and the calling out of plagiarism as a response to the same thing. These people, at least intuitively, maybe not necessarily consciously, but intuitively understand that YouTube is now beyond capacity. The bubble has popped, and thus, things need to degrow. For the YouTubers who have successfully scaled, that means putting less of their valuable time into it. MatPat has four successful channels, and now he gets to stay home and play video games with his wife. Uh, not for content, like he said in his video. 
For YouTubers like Tom Scott, who are scaling back, it means that he's got to put less money and time towards production, probably travel less, or perhaps travel in more concentrated bursts in which he optimizes the travel to cost less, and then calling out plagiarism, which is doing what is possible to knock people like James Summerton out of the ecosystem so that the time in a day that the bread tube liking viewer has increases. This kind of problem is going to happen cyclically uh, until capitalism's defining contradiction is resolved. That is to say, the socialization of production with the private appropriation of product and therefore profit. Uh, and that's what Marxism is. It's trying to figure out how to resolve that contradiction. But we can talk about that another day. Uh, this is this has gone on long enough. I hope this provided some kind of insight, maybe something to think about when you're watching the next why I'm scaling back or quitting YouTube video from whoever. Or while you're taking part in a harassment mob to get somebody off of the internet who has plagiarized or used AI. These are just measures that are intended to prolong the situation without solving that contradiction. Thanks a lot. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Maybe become a patron too. That would be cool. Um, but most of all, I hope you have a nice day. Bye.